So unless there's a, uh, we find a way to share uh, what's going on, unfortunately, hockey uh, is a dead issue here in Canada, in small markets. You only go through this career once, so you can't afford to screw up. You can't afford to be making mistakes. We're going to keep growing the game and making it bigger and better. And as the money grows here, don't change. I want to be in a position to average out 1-5. Jesus Christ. You're fighting for a job here, and unless we see you be more assertive, you're going to Kentucky Friday morning. Why, Pinch? Why? You got no chance to get the puck anyways. Maybe it is time to think about two officials in one line. You should have a Canadian division. You can write a check for about 10 million, and that'll do it. If we continue to grow, then our shot in the barrel will come also. Someone once said, it's more important to the nation than many of the political ideals we pretend to believe in. The House of Commons endorsed it anyway, as Canada's national game. It's been called our winter ballet, the dance of life in a cold climate, the national drama, the national conversation, the one place where all the themes of Canadian life get played out. And now, it's in trouble. The Edmonton Oilers were one of the greatest hockey teams of all time. Led first by Wayne Gretzky, then by Mark Messier, the Oilers won the Stanley Cup five times in seven years. Today's Oilers can play the game, too. In the 97-98 season, they advance as far in the playoffs as any other Canadian team. They reach the second round before losing to the Dallas Stars in five games. But they spend most of the season in limbo. This year, team management's focus is not so much on winning or losing hockey games. It's on keeping the team in Edmonton. This year, Storied Edmonton Oilers go up for sale. Let's go. You got to you got to train from hell. After 20 years as team owner, Peter Pocklington is 100 million dollars in debt. I've therefore made the tough decision uh, to sell the team. I've done my best to keep the team here in the past. And I'll do my best to sell the team to people who will keep it here in the future. My first priority is to seek out local investors to step forward and take my place. Within weeks, Texas millionaire Les Alexander offers Pocklington $82.5 million U.S. to buy the team and likely move it to Houston. Yes, we do. We have a handshake agreement which is being papered over the weekend by our mutual lawyers and uh, hopefully it'll get done. This is the third time in as many years that a Canadian NHL team seems headed for the States. Money, the team was finally sold. Save our Save our Save our Last time it was the Winnipeg Jets. The owner wanted a new rink. When he didn't get one, the team was sold to Phoenix in 1995 and renamed the Coyotes. Hockey fans met again at Fortitude Main in the largest public gathering since the World War. That same year, the Quebec Nordiques were sold to Colorado, renamed the Avalanche. The same players won the Stanley Cup the very next year. I don't think anybody's going to blame us by not taking the engagement to lose that kind of money for many years to come with no hope. We haven't received an offer from local First, bidders. Winnipeg and Quebec get in trouble. Now, Pocklington himself. The Texas multimillionaire is still interested but local investors are staying away. Welcome any offer from Edmonton to keep it here. If there are local buyers, show up. <laughs> One group of local investors has been trying to show up for months. 
Motivated by civic and national pride, Edmonton oil and gas executive Cal Nichols and his associates have been working hard to keep the oilers in Edmonton. But they are running out of time. The sales deadline is Friday, March 13th, just three days away. The facts are this. On the equity uh, investment side, we are currently just under $50 million committed. We still need, as of now, approximately $10 million of additional equity. And I, I would like to ask anyone who is capable and interested in participating in our group to come forward as soon as possible, as our deadline is rapidly approaching. Nichols has transformed his suburban Edmonton office into what he and his team call a war room. Uh, Premier Klein phoned me at home last night and uh, wanted to know what else he could do to further our cause to... Uh, Their current money-raising scheme is to rename Northland's Coliseum Petroleum Place and have Alberta's major oil and gas companies sponsor the team. And I told the Premier last night that... Uh, Another follow-up uh, letter fax from him would be yeah. helpful, and he, he also agreed to uh, make a few personal phone calls. And uh, Doug McFarlane works with Nichols in oil and gas. Reg Berry is in broadcasting. Longtime friends, they are accomplished in their fields, but most observers don't give them much of a chance. For these companies, I think it's important they participate in community building. Right now, I think we've got about two million new and uh, in new commitments. The feeling is, the Oilers will wind up south of the border. Uh, two million a year over three years. Besides these, the reality is that there's not going to be an announcement uh, tomorrow, mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to be uh, Friday, late Friday at best, because uh, the guys just it's a leap of faith. It's too much leaps, too many leaps of faith here, I th and we got some. Uh, Irons in the fire that still may materialize, uh, that may get us closer to where we want to be. So, If hockey is Canada's national game, and the Oilers are such a legendary team, how can this be? Why is it so hard to keep an NHL team in Canada? Fifty-two hundred kilometers southeast of Edmonton, the NHL Board of Governors winter meetings take place at the Breakers Luxury Resort Hotel. All 26 NHL team owners or their designates attend. The focus of today's session is another Canadian team. The board will decide whether to allow the Toronto Maple Leafs to move back into the Eastern Conference. The move would reignite the Leafs' traditional rivalry with the Montreal Canadiens and permit those games to be broadcast on Eastern Primetime TV. The motion mostly affects the struggling small market Canadian teams, Edmonton and Calgary, who fear losing their popular and profitable games against the Leafs. It's big for us. I mean, it's a big issue for, uh, for uh, Calgary and Edmonton and Vancouver. For us, it's a, and it's, and I think also it's a nationalistic issue. It's not just—it's just not money. It's—it's uh, it's keeping Canada whole and the rivalry is going. And uh, do you think you have the votes here? Or is that... No idea. Eh? No idea. Is it very close? Oh, whenever you need three quarters, it's always close. The only one that's care are the Canadians. <laughs> the Canadian teams. The rest of us don't care. Which way are you going to vote? I don't care where they go. It doesn't make any difference to us. I care. I know you do. You're a Canadian team and they should be playing. You should have a Canadian division. That's right, exactly. Leave you guys up there and come down here once a week. Once a year. The playing has to Commissioner Gary Bettman has proposed a compromise. It would move Toronto back into the east, but keep two high-profile Leafs games out west against each of Calgary, Edmonton, and Vancouver. For the next five years, additional games would also be played against St. Louis, Chicago, and Detroit. In the end, the motion passes with two abstentions. It's the right result. Uh, it works for a lot of teams, and uh, it's important. I think it's terrific. I think it'll be good for Canadian television. I think it's good for travel. Uh, I think it's uh, good that we were able to work it out. It's the NHL can solve some Canadian team problems. Others 
the NHL can do nothing about. Escalating player salaries is one of them. There comes a time when... when... Uh... Ten years ago, Edmonton's Wayne Gretzky was sold to the Los Angeles Kings because Peter Pockington said he could no longer afford to keep the great one in Canada. Glenn Sather was the Oilers' GM then. He still is. We pay, talking about the Canadian teams, the majority of our salaries in U.S. dollars. So we're paying almost 50% more than the American teams are. But there's no breaks for the Canadian teams. Calgary, Edmonton, Ottawa. Very difficult for us to compete. Sather feels things are getting worse. This year, he and the Oilers may lose their star goalie. We got a problem with Curtis Joseph. At the end of the season, he's going to be a free agent. You know, I've been trying to get him signed now for over a year. So I've got to make a judgment on whether I keep Curtis throughout this whole year, this current year, or trade him. Well, if the American team wants Curtis bad enough, pay him whatever they want. 300 kilometers down the road, the Calgary Flames, unlike Edmonton, have a stable ownership. A nine-man consortium who are in it primarily for the love of the game. Lots of tight shots of the ownership, I'll tell you. He didn't tighten that chairman of the board. The Calgary GM, Al Coates, still has to make do with the smallest payroll in the league. Yeah, and he can't play in these two games. That's right. His overall strategy is to build a team with players that are mostly young and unproven. This year, he's begun to worry about re-signing the team's only star. Highest bidder. Well, I would like to stay in Calgary for sure, you know, but hockey's a business now, and, and uh, you know, I know Calgary's a small market team, and, and there's only so much money they're able to pay and afford to pay, and, and, you know, I'd like to think that, you know, there's a deal there somewhere where both sides can be happy, and, you know, all I know is, is Calgary, and, and uh, you know, my memories of Calgary are, you know, fun, you know. 89 Stanley Cup. I think Fleury epitomized a lot of things that are great about our game. Uh, and, and I hope we never lose Fleury, quite frankly, because nobody plays harder. I think when you're going to have one real good player like there and Fleury, you have to at least have two or three others. And so you're into a several million dollars per player on a team. Now, are you better to go to that course or are you do it better to have 20 guys that are a little bit maybe lesser in stature? but really compose a close-knit team, a team that's going to work together and, and hopefully emerge together. And to some extent, that's what we've begun here, and that's the process that we're in. La, 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 la. Marketing man and broadcasting executive Ron Bremner is the Flames president and CEO. He's the one who has to set the team's budget. These aren't signatures. These are opportunities. We're just doing everything we can twice as hard because we have to keep up with Ken Dryden and Brian Delmore and the Toronto Maple Police in that big market. You know, if we can take in $4,000 a night from a suite uh, times 40 games, it's 160,000 times two, that's $320,000. That's the left leg of a third line forward. So now what we have to do is go out and find uh, opportunities to get the right leg. Now we start working on the torso, and, and that's what you have to do. And you have to break it down. As somebody once said, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And that's what we're doing. We're eating elephants every day here. Back in Edmonton, the airwaves are full of ideas about how to save the Oilers. It's been packaged together for the people of Edmonton so they can be we have 15 people holding one or more units at this, at this moment. For the, the ordinary Joe in, uh, in Edmonton, like Green Bay did with uh, yeah. the Packers. Yeah. Do something like that. The I mean, National Football uh, League's Green Bay Packers have made their fans feel the team belongs to them by selling them shares. But Cal Nichols would prefer to limit ownership of the Oilers. Yeah, well, uh, they, they, uh, they did this in, uh, in uh, Florida with the, uh, with the Panthers. And also, it's, uh, it's been done just most recently in Green Bay with their football team. The thing is, I would prefer not to do it to the third year because uh, of the uh, limited partnership. Nichols feels limiting ownership will ultimately increase the value of the team 
That is, if there still is a team here in two days. You can write a check for about $10 million and that'll do it. That's all we need. I'll come over and pick it up. I mean, our chances of finding, you know, 100 people with $100,000 to get the $10 million that we need in the next two days uh, don't like the chances of that. I mean, we don't want people going out and breaking the piggy bank and, and borrowing money to do this because we can't guarantee them a return. Imperial's management team wishes to advise that we decline the opportunity to participate in your proposal for naming, the naming of Northlands Coliseum. Best of luck with your venture. Today there's bad news on the petroleum place luck. front. We need money. Petro None Canada, of the big money oil and gas boys seem interested. The equity guys in this deal that are putting their own money up have to look at this and say, I'm going to risk my money and find that the biggest corporations in Alberta aren't interested in, you know, in, in commercial support. I mean, that's got to send up a red flag. You got to say, well, it's, you know what, maybe this isn't the right place for uh, NHL hockey team. The smart money may have given up on the franchise, but Edmonton's hockey fans are doing everything they can to keep the team in town. Molson's went a dollar a dozen, we went a dime. We're small, that's what we can afford this time. We will do over 2,000 dozen out of this store alone. Hopefully that will make a difference. I believe it would just be another shame that we lost the team. We've been donating uh, one dollar from every ten wings sold, our chicken wing sales, and so far we have have about two thousand dollars from that. Um, our 1998 All Canadian Girls calendar, we've also donated one dollar from that as well to go to the Save the Oiler Fund. If, if you're in in the, in the States and you've got uh, a team in trouble, you've got, let's, for numbers, you've got a hundred people that can step in, well, you're going to get somebody. In Edmonton, you've got ten people who can step in. Well, the odds aren't as good. It'll be the, another Canadian team gone. You don't want that. You want to keep them here. I mean, the Oilers sell out every game and they can't afford to be here. It's sad. It's very sad. Like Winnipeg, Quebec, we can't lose them more. Hockey's Canada, not the States. Even in the shinny game, you can find him. The kid who can just flat out play better than anyone else. You know, every second person has an outdoor rink. It's just something they could do on a, you know, after school or an evening. Just get out there in the outdoor rink or, or a lot of the man-made lakes here. And, you know, it's just packed with, with kids playing shinny. Or... I've made backyard rinks. In Saskatoon, the kid is Jared Stowe. A lot of people say he's the next Wayne Gretzky. This is the gold medal that uh, Jared's team won at the Western Canadian Bantam Championships. Just 15, he's already got an agent. This year the agent started and uh, that was a whole new uh, new part of the game even for even myself. I didn't realize or understand that uh, uh, there's some real good ones out there, but there's some poor ones out there. And Jared has selected uh, his agent. Uh, I narrowed it down to, to two or three and I left him uh, him to sign after that. He's had a real good game. He's uh, he's playing at a level here where he's uh, a year younger than everybody else in the tournament, and uh, he's a real pivotal guy, you know, on their team, playing the point and the power play. He's a real good player. Stoll's outstanding offensive abilities make him the exception to the Canadian rule. One of the many problems facing the Canadian game is that homegrown skilled players are fast becoming an endangered species. Good to see you, buddy. Congratulations. Well, you guys we start young age all the time. We, uh, we're out on the ponds all the time. and After supper at Christmas, we're always skating. We're always, we always got our blades on. So. I don't know, just maybe more opportunities to the rinks, little towns. Like I came from a little town when I was younger. We could get on the ice anytime we wanted to, so it really helped me out down there. And this it helps out the Saskatchewan boys because it's all little communities. 
I don't think it'll ever die. In the, you know, the, the, it'll ever die in the prairies. Little kids still have the dreams, I guess. If Jared Stoll goes as high as expected in the NHL's 2000 entry draft, it'll be because NHL Central Scouting put him there. 653X4. Ben Beast Kirk. We go through it early December, now in the middle of uh, January, and then our final ranking is in uh, late uh, April, early May. Our scouts will see oh, an average of about 125, 130 games a year. Cook over Levesque, Levesque over Cook. The league scouts meet three times a year to rank the North American talent pool. He's got to improve his skill level, but lately. He, what they've been seeing out of Canada okay, really isn't reassuring. The players we're discussing right now, it looks like, uh, oh, about 60-40 for a Canadian as opposed to U.S. We're, we're getting more U.S. players all the time. A generation ago, 90% of all NHL players were Canadian. Today, it's 60% and dropping, with most elite players coming from the United States and Europe. That's enhanced the U.S. Uh, development a uh, great deal. For 19 years, Murray Costello has overseen all hockey development in Canada. He worries that Canada is turning out too many grinders and not enough playmakers. He thinks he knows why. The one concern that is a very big one is the ratio of practice to games in our system. Uh, parents like to see their kids compete, but not in practice. Coaches are judged on win-loss records at the earliest ages, not on practice teaching. Uh, for kids, practice isn't as much fun. They're, they're ready to compete all of the time. But you don't do much teaching in, practice, in, in games, and, and uh, we compete all of the time. I, I think that's really unhealthy, and somehow we've got to tone that back, cut it back, and get into the practice session so we can really teach. And to leave time for shinny, you know, just, just playing with the puck and get the creativity back in the game. Give them, give them the chance to really enjoy playing, have fun doing it. If Canadian junior hockey ever does manage to turn itself around, it'd be nice if there were some Canadian teams left to play for. Right now, it doesn't look as though Edmonton will be one of them. Bob, it's one, it would be one of the most important contributions made. I mean, that would be the thing that could take this thing over the top. Well, on a standalone basis, uh, one U.S. a year. So this is down to perhaps they stay, they go time. And uh, I'm sitting at table number such and such, and uh, if there's anybody there that could pitch in and denominations of a million dollars or more, come and see me quick. For the past couple of years, Canadian team owners have been meeting privately with the commissioner to discuss their common problems and possible solutions. So how are you doing, Commissioner? Your part doing great. Yeah. Good. The competition is beautiful. Thank you. I go to every building. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I listen. Yeah. Okay. I listen. I watch. I talk to the fans, and I watch to three or four games a night. I know what the problem is. Yeah. You're right. Uh, they didn't have our room we, ready. We were jealous. <laughs> yeah. Most people run are running their own buildings now. An opportunity to try and help with events and marketing, and ticketing, and and ways of helping one another out. You know, with uh, Montreal is doing a really good job with their building, bringing the events in. We need that in Calgary. So does Edmonton, Ottawa. So I think the sharing of information is really what's paramount. You know, I know you got a fistful of problems, but he's the guy I like to have on the other side trying to fix it for me. I think we're paying for the room, so we'll say sit down. Can we get, uh, get going, gentlemen, if we can? Whenever the question of small market team revenues crops up, Gary Bettman likes to talk about the NFL. See, had long been saddled with the reputation. The Green Bay Packers are a small market team. They not only won the Super Bowl last year, they had an operating budget of $78 million U.S., $60 million more than either the Edmonton or Calgary Hockey Club. Why? Every NFL team gets a share of the league's $17.6 billion television deal over eight years. Canadian NHL team owners are convinced 
It has to happen here. You get a third of the deal at the NFL got to be wonderful for us. But we have to have a major television contract in order to survive. I'm talking about the Canadian teams. That's going to be the saving grace of the Canadian teams at some stage, especially Calgary, Edmonton, and Ottawa. Nobody has to have us yet. But that's what we're working to. The commissioner believes the NHL's big American TV deal is just around the corner. The good news is, in an era of fragmentation, networks need something special that differentiates them. Live sports is those special things. So from our standpoint, people want to have sports. Okay, we're not comparable, nor is the NBA or baseball to the NFL. But it proves the point that it's sports is good programming. The NFL is in a class by itself. The NBA did well. And if, if we continue to grow and we're desirable programming, then our shot in the barrel will come also. While they wait for that shot in the barrel to materialize, Canada's small market teams must focus on more mundane matters, like getting to the game. And that's it. Well, uh, I didn't even look. I'm, so, I, I'm assuming it's probably just as bad. Oh, my saint it in. Western Canadian teams must that's pay just, triple leg, right? or more for their travel and, uh, compared ABC, to teams in the East. BF, so bees are in it's East. understandable that the Oilers can't afford their own jet or charter flights. We never get medals. We get about. But the savings they make by flying commercial cost the team in other ways. And it's all the decision has to be made between $2 million to go toward a player or operating the team as opposed to flying on a charter plane. Uh, the decision is fairly easy to make. Did, uh, did anybody see Cujo? You seen him? The uh, teams that charter yeah, probably have uh, at least a 5 to 10 point leg up on everybody else that doesn't. Here, this is a way too late to be arriving for flights. Travel fatigue adds up. By the end of the season, it can cost the team a playoff berth or mean an early playoff exit. It's not an easy way, and it certainly does have a bearing on how you perform over a long period of time. You do this for a year, and it's exhausting. He's still at home, do you think? No one that has controlled the purse strings for the Edmonton Oilers has done this with any malice. Uh, it's just a grim reality of economics. You only have so much money coming in, and Instead of spending a million dollars a year on airfares, you're spending three million. That's what a charter adds to your bottom line expenses. And if you buy a plane, like LA did and Vancouver has, it adds ten. Check him off too, because I want to know what this, this. If there's one bag missing, I, know, I have to know the number. Is it better to to sign a, another player or give a player give in on a contract to keep that player in Edmonton, or do we charter? I don't know. Maybe we should get the players to chip in. I don't know. <laughs> The real problem we got right now is that we're just uh, we're short uh, somewhere around ten million dollars of equity, and I don't know where we're going to find it in uh, forty-eight hours or less. But uh, for the local oiler investment team, the countdown has now begun in earnest. Jesus, if we could just get forty-eight hours left, and they still haven't raised the money. Uh, with another half a dozen guys from around town, we'll get her made. And, local uh, investors must so know that in today's NHL, you can put a good team on the ice. Fill every seat in the house, build a new arena, and still lose money. They must also know that doing anything less is not an option. Montreal recently spent $230 million on Molson Center. Edmonton, prior to its current troubles, renovated Northlands to the tune of $30 million. Calgary Saddle Dome renovation cost $37 million. Vancouver's GM place cost 160 million. And then there's the Corral Center in Ottawa. Built in 1996, it cost 215 million dollars. It has lots of corporate boxes. Most buildings don't have that level of suites. Most buildings are between 80 and 120 suites and they're all at the two levels we have them. See, we've got 100 there and we've got I mean they're, we're all sold out now. Even the Toronto Maple Leafs feel they have to move. Maple Leaf Gardens may be paid for. It may have tradition. It may be intimate. But it was built in the Depression. Hockey fans have moved on. We have to move because we need a bigger space that has more seats and more uh, corporate boxes and more amenities, you know, for a fan. And those are the things that translate into 
uh, the revenues that allow you to sign players and to keep players. I think as well as that, times change, people change, tastes change. People have said, I'd like a seat that's a little bit bigger. Why do I have to sit in a wooden seat? I don't sit in wooden seats at home. Why do I have to eat lousy hot dogs and, and stale beer? Just as Maple Leaf Gardens took the fan of Toronto of 1931 and put him into circumstances that were consistent with his circumstances of 1931, so will Air Canada Centre put the Toronto fan of, of 1999. This year, the business of hockey has finally become a matter of public debate. Canadians are worried about losing their teams. Canada being Canada, a parliamentary subcommittee has been struck to investigate. Commissioner Gary Bettman and the six Canadian team owners come to Parliament Hill for the hearings. Uh, it's the beginning of the process of trying to prove to the world or the Canadians that we're not loaded because we start off with 35% deficit right off the bat. In the United States, it's different. The Florida Panthers' new rink costs $270 million. The county pays for it. The Buffalo Sabres finance their new facility with $15 million from the city, $22 million from the county, and $36 million from the state. I thought it was outstanding. I mean, The commissioner and the Canadian NHL team owners would like to see things like that happen here. And uh, welcome to our continued hearings on the, uh, the industry of sport in Canada. Uh, Mr. Bettman, maybe you would uh, properly introduce those uh, colleagues that are with you. On behalf of the entire National Hockey League, I would like to thank you for inviting our six Canadians. There were really only two points we were seeking to get made and acknowledged. The first is that NHL hockey is an important business, an economic engine. There are 11,000 jobs that are attributable to NHL hockey in the arenas. There's a billion dollar of private money that was invested in infrastructure improvement in Canadian communities. That there's a couple to 300 million a year in taxes that our teams pay. And that therefore, we wanted a recognition that we're more than just some sport, that we are an important business. It's not a market problem, it's a Canada relative to U.S. tax and public policy problem, and I hope this committee will at least notice that it's true and ask the government to do some real analytical work to recommend what to do about it. So are you saying what Dennis Mills' committee will do, I hope, is to set in context of why North America is absolutely critical to Canadian professional hockey. It would be absurd to say, well, let's just draw a line across at the parallel and uh, we'll play hockey in Canada, lots of people to watch it. Uh, but it would not be the same. It matters that the New York Rangers are coming here tonight. It matters that you're part of the best in the world, not just the best in Canada. But if we're going to do that, we have to find some way to have the playing field not so completely uphill uh, that the best players can't be held at the top of the hill. They just always run down to where the money is. And to do that, one can either find some way to tell the United States that you should legislate something to prevent subsidizing pro sports teams. Good luck or we can find some way to impose fewer public burdens on Canadian pro sports teams. I'm kind of astounded when you find out that Ottawa had to pay for their own turnabout, you know, off the Trans-Canada Highway to get into their building. It's the only one that any private industry has paid for in this country, from border to border. It's the only place. And, uh, you know, the, the money that Montreal has paid for the most is sent the, the taxes they pay in that place is astounding. We have given the three level of government last year $30 million in different taxes. This includes the GST, the Quebec sales tax, the building tax, the business tax, and the capital tax. This is all revenue for the three level of government, and they don't have to invest one dollar. The issue is, are our teams being taxed into oblivion? The Montreal Canadiens spent $250 million of their own Molson's money to build a brand new state-of-the-art building in downtown Montreal, the biggest piece of privately funded construction in Montreal in the last decade. And in return for which, they get taxed at three times the rate of all the teams in the United States put together. 
That's not about us getting our house in order. That's not about us healing ourselves. That's about whether or not that team and that building have been fairly treated. Is that sports? The idea of NHL teams seeking government assistance offends some Canadians. We thought of sports as a world apart that uh, lived by a different set. It won't affect Ken Dryden in a large market like Toronto. But he can see a bleak future for the small market Canadian teams if changes are not made. What you can start to see happening in sports is teams that you say, they will never win a World Series. They will never win a Super Bowl. There is no possibility of them winning a Super Bowl or an NBA championship or a Stanley Cup. And you want never to get to that point. Are we there on Canada? I, we're not there, but, but we are... We're, 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 we're treading around the edges, you know, in, in, in some cases. Edmonton's situation is again a case in point. They certainly have some good young kids there, but will they ever be able to compete for a cup if the costs are so tightly watched? Uh, I don't know, the kids are probably, when their contracts come up, if you ask uh, Glenn Sather in Edmonton, you know, the, the kids want to get out of there after three or four years. Glenn's very much tried to control his, his payroll so that he could afford to keep the team in, in Edmonton, and he can't keep them there. If the debate begins and ends with the point that you're not economic engines, you don't provide jobs, you don't provide tax dollars, you have no economic consequence, if that's the conclusion, then we can end the discussion. But it, it can't be the conclusion because there is an important, you just have to look at the communities that are in there, is an important economic component of what our teams provide. If this issue was a Toronto issue, if the Toronto Maple Leafs were leaving Toronto on the same, you know, under the same kinds of conditions and, and, and uh, economic kind of duress, I'll tell you, they'd be lining up on Bay Street at King to say, well, what do we do to help? You know, what can we do to help? And we got to fight and scratch and say, geez, we're out here 2,000 miles away, but we also have five Stanley Cup banners up there and a history and a legacy, and uh, um, we need your help. And so far, it ain't working. So there's only one group of guys now that are going to make this call, and that's the guys that are going to be sitting around tonight till all hours looking at each other and saying, are we going to go or not? And if we're gone, boy, we, we're taking some huge risks. Tomorrow. I lost my job last year. It's the best coach in the league, so they say. Losing will not be acceptable in this city. And the fundamental lack of respect that the industry has for the coaches in any other major sport. We're only one of two teams left. We were a team of destiny, and we were going to win the Stanley Cup. I love the game itself. The final episode of The New Ice Age, tomorrow at 9 on CBC. I'm Carol McNeil. It's been nine months since the ice storm. You can imagine what's happening now, next on The National. The New Ice Age, a year in the life of the NHL on CBC. Brought to you by Bell, connecting you to the people, places, and things that matter. And by Ford, for now, forever. For Cal Nichols, his lawyer, and the rest of the local Euler investment team, the decision to go ahead with the purchase comes down to a last minute late night meeting. We'll have some additional things to do and we hope to be able to finish them tonight and tomorrow and uh, if we're successful we'll have a press conference but I've said even if we aren't successful we'll have a press conference tomorrow uh, through the ED offices and they'll get in touch with everybody give everybody lots of notice. And how long are you guys going to be here tonight? Who knows uh, maybe all night. Do you know Mr. Mayor if in fact they have enough money right now? At 8 the next morning Nichols gets ready to make a public announcement. I can do that. I can have that. But uh, what I want to do is just uh, 
Good afternoon, uh, everyone. And thank He's you. learned some hard lessons about small Coming market team this. reality these past few months. Encouraged us. He's not sure an act of parliament is required to save hockey in Canada. But he does feel the league ought to do something. I think there has to be some form of rationalization in, in salaries because if it continues to escalate the way it is, I don't think Edmonton is the only team in the league that's, that's going to be in trouble. I think the whole league is going to be in trouble. And, and the more they let this go on, the more they're driving it to a multi-tier hockey league without really telling the public that they've done it. In the end, Cal Nichols has found not one or two, but 35 local investors. At a cost of one to five million dollars each, they are prepared to make a leap of faith. What we tried to do is sell it on the basis of uh, community first motives as opposed to uh, for profit. And I, I like to refer to the group that we have brought together as really the blue collar millionaires of uh, this market. Because many of them, uh, they just are people who uh, worked hard, got in the trenches, rolled up their sleeves, and have been very, very successful in manufacturing and distribution and, uh, and in some of the, uh, the oil field supply companies. So uh, these, there's not anybody in this group that are, uh, are junk bond dealers or uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of major corporations. These, these are really uh, grassroots millionaires that are participating in this project. I think the plan is to keep it here forever. Small market, make it work in a small market. And I think if we can, uh, if we can make it work here, we'll uh, set a real precedent for Canada, for Canadian hockey. And and we really, you know, it's our part of our culture and our heritage. So let's keep her here. Okay, is everybody ready? Edmonton's hockey community has been forced to choose between good business sense and its heart. Unable to see the team go the way of Winnipeg and Quebec, the community has come down on the side of its heart. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I would like first to thank you all for coming and being with us. This is going to be a great day for Edmonton. As of this afternoon, the Edmonton Investors Group delivered an offer and the required deposit to purchase the Edmonton Oilers. I want you to know that our group of investors When news of the Oilers sale to local buyers reaches Glenn Sather and Peter Pucklington in Palm Springs, California, neither seems overjoyed. It takes money to be competitive in the NHL today. They've you know, struggle to get enough money to be able to buy the team, and now if they're going to give us enough to operate it so that we can be a, a major league franchise is one thing, but if it's a Band-Aid solution, then it's not going to solve itself because it'll surface again in three or four years. Maybe they know too much about what lies ahead. The local group of 15 or 20 people uh, and with a big bank loan are going to try and keep hockey in Edmonton. I, I wish them Godspeed. I hope it works for them all. Um, I do know they're going to have some losses or they're going to have to cut their payroll to where they might disappoint the fans with a team that might not show up on the ice. So they've got, a, they've got a real dilemma. Skyrocketing player salaries, heavy taxes, a declining Canadian dollar. The problems facing the new owners are massive and ongoing. But for now, it's mission accomplished in Edmonton. The Oilers didn't win the cup this year, but they did manage to survive. I do it because one day I'll be the best. I do it because I want to give something back to the game. I do it for my dad, who tells me how proud I make him. I do it just for the fun of it. I do it because I love the game. Live the dream, the one and only.